All right. Well, good morning, gang. How's everyone doing today? You guys alive? Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. And um, yeah, man, me too. I got to go to the Hillsong concert, and it was like, oh, man. But Hillsong ain't got nothing on you guys. So you guys give yourselves a a hand because you guys are awesome. It's just like, oh, man, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. It's so good to worship with our our family, our brothers and sisters, and and raise one voice for the name of Jesus. Come on, can you guys be excited about Jesus this morning? Today we're going to be preaching about Jesus. We're going to be looking at his words, and and it's going to be something where it's like, can you just imagine Jesus talking to us? If, If we had him, you know, in your notes all in red, it would be correct because it would be the words of Jesus today. Today we're focusing all about Jesus and what he says, what Jesus says about us and and, and what Jesus wants for us. We're going to be looking in the the John chapter 13, the high priestly prayer where Jesus is is, is pleading to the Father before he goes to face his, his ultimate glory on the cross. And um, Jesus is over there, and, and it's, like, um, it's like a dad going, you know, on a long vacation trip. Not, not a vacation trip, a work trip, okay? Because being away from the kids is like a vacation, but it's not a vacation trip, it's a work trip. So I was thinking about what, um, what, what uh, Justin was saying about mom's man up. Oh, you're in trouble, Justin. <laughs> this past week, we were having these conversations about, man, how, what, a, what a joy it is to be a parent, you know? Um, it, it's such a joy, but then at times too, it's just so hard. You know, we, we've we've been like raising kids now for like the past eight years and haven't slept in eight years. So, um, you know, we're kind of like, oh man, when are we gonna start to sleep and when are we gonna start to you know not have to pick up toys and but then of course, right, I know, I know, I get it, right? Teenagers are much harder, right? Right, Emma? No, not so much. <laughs> No, easier, easier, okay. But, um, but man, right now it's just one of those times in those seasons and it's like, I get it, you know, um, mommies here, can, can I just take a moment right now to, to pray and to bless the mommies? Yeah, would you all join me right now and, and, and help to pray and bless them right now? Mm. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. Um, we thank you for... These unsung heroes, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would give them the glory that they deserve, the honor that they deserve, Lord. These mothers, Lord. Um, These mothers who, who give so much, Lord Jesus. Lord. We know your heart for them, Lord. We say thank you, Lord, to these moms right now. We pray, Lord, that your your blessing would like just overflow on them right now, Lord Jesus. Pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help them to know how appreciated they are. There's a mom in here um, uh, that needs a touch. Can you just go ahead and touch the person next to you? And, and right now, we just want to pray for them right now, real quick. Oh. Lord Jesus, if there's a feeling that they need right now, an extra strength that they need right now, Lord, would you just give it to them? We don't want to just hear about you, Lord, or know about you in our heads, Lord. We want to know that, that you actually care, that you actually can do something miraculous right now. So, Lord Jesus, would you bless these moms in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to preach really good, guys. Woo! All the moms are going to be like, oh, that Jay, he's a really good preacher, you know? (laughs) Right? You know? And so, good. That's what it was all about. Brownie points. That's what life's all about, man, I tell you. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't even remember my code. (laughs) Okay, I remembered it. Okay, it's good. Oh, man, technology these days, you know, like my kids, like they're like technology, 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 you know, and, um, you know, they, they want to watch TV 
We don't give them iPads and stuff, one, because we can't afford it. But then um, it's just one of those things where my kids, they're like, oh, daddy, can I watch? And I'm like, watch? Why do we need to watch? Daddy has bought you like a million toys. <laughs> Our yard is like, 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 like the size of, you know, Madison Square Garden. And I just swear, like, kids, why do you guys need to watch? Oh, Daddy, I just want to watch. It's too hot outside. <laughs> you know, Daddy, um, you know, I just want to watch because, you know, I just want to relax, relax, relax. <laughs> I'm going, where did these kids get it from, man? <laughs> <sighs> Must be the mom. But, but then, right, right, and then so, though, right, I love being outside, I love being in the garden, you know, I love, you know, working on, you know, digging stuff up, but, but man, my kids, they don't like to be outside, but, but just the other day, we got to go and play with another family, right, so Brian over here, I can, I can kind of give him credit for it, because they're like, hey, we're going to go to the park, and we're going to ride bikes, I'm like, oh, okay, I only got one that can ride a bike right now. He goes, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to ride bikes. And then my boy Jens, he just sees the bike and he's like, oh, I want to do it. My older sister can do it, but I want to do it too, you know. And my, my, my boy Jens, man, he, he's got some pretty strong will. My keys in, he's got the strongest will. It's like crazy. But, but my, my boy Jens, he, he sees the bike and he's like, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, he's going to cry. He's going to fall down, and I'm going to have to deal with all this. Oh, boy. You know? But then Uncle Brian, he's so patient. If you ever see their kids, he does this braid thing on the little girls every morning. He's such a patient dad. I mean, you know, whatever. But anyway, so Brian gets Jens, right? He's like, Jens, don't worry. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens you. You can do this, Jens. And, and Jens is looking at Uncle Brian like, yeah. My daddy don't tell me that. My daddy tell me don't cry when you fall down. You know? And then so, so, so Brian goes and he gets Jens and whoosh. Riding bike. Like first crack. And then he's over there and he's doing these wheelie things. And he's, whoo. And I'm like, oh, Jens, you're on your sister's pink bike. And you know, um, his, his birthday was coming up, and then me and Ayako were like, we, oh, if we buy him a bike, he's not going to know how to take care of it. It's going to get rusty. And it's like, he's only six. And like, oh, you know, and so we we're thinking about it, but then we we're such, you know, we we're so weak. We, so we, we, we bought him a bike for his birthday, right? Yeah, so we bought him a bike for his birthday. And so now him and his sister, right, they, they start going outside and riding bikes, you know? And um, this is something new for our family, that, that they're actually going outside and playing, you know? And so we're like loving it, but then we're like, wait a minute, they're still little. There's cars out there, and I don't want to be outside watching them ride the bike all day. You know? But then all of a sudden, it's like when kids start playing around, all of a sudden there's like a multiplication thing that starts happening. You know, um, like two kids start coming out from their house. I go, oh, I didn't know kids lived over there, you know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there's like a gang of 10 of them riding around our street. And I'm going, oh, this looks kind of dangerous, <laughs> you know. But then, wow, my, my kids started going out and playing on the bike, you know. And sometimes I'm like, where, where are they? Ayako, where are they? Oh, I think they're outside playing on the bike. They didn't tell me, so I got to go outside. Hey, guys. Um, if you're gonna go outside, you gotta let me know. Okay, Dad, okay, Dad, yeah, right? And then all of a sudden, now they're outside, they're playing. And now I gotta call them to come inside, you know, when it's time to come in and eat, right? And so, um, Noelle, she's my, 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 my oldest daughter, she's eight years old, right? So I say, hey, Noelle, go, go tell the boys it's time to come in, you know, it's getting dark. And so Noelle, she goes outside and she tells the boys, okay, guys, it's time to come in. You better come in, you know, just, you, you better come in. And they're not listening to her. And then, so, they, they, she, I don't know where she gets that either. <laughs> but, um, but she comes back in and she tells me, Daddy, Jens and Kizen are not listening. They're not listening and they're not coming back inside the house. I said, you know what, Noah, you know what you do? Tell them, Daddy said. <laughs> Daddy said, come back inside the house. She goes back out there. Daddy said, come back inside the house. Daddy said, Daddy, 
you can get it if you don't come back in, daddy said. Right? Then all of a sudden you see them come scurrying in, you know. No, they didn't. So I had to tell them, tell them mommy said. Yeah? And then they started scurrying back in, right? But, but, but man, really what we're trying to look at right now is this thing of, man, there's this authority of who says what. You know? There's an authority when someone who has authority says something that's really meaningful and really powerful. You know, at, at home, right, they'll say, well, mommy said I can watch TV. I say, okay, mommy said that we ain't fighting, you know. And then, and then they say, mommy said I can eat ice cream for breakfast. I'm like, now you're lying, <laughs> you know. But there's something that comes with this authority and this power. And today what we want to do is we want to look at what Jesus says. When Jesus says is the name of our title. Last week, we got to talk a little bit about Jesus' culture and forgiveness. And man, that was amazing. Um, I told Pastor Pat, I said, Pastor Pat, why I got to talk after Pastor Marion? You know, she's like a conference preacher and all that kind of stuff. Why I got to do it? He goes, better you than me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. So Pastor Pat, if you're watching somewhere, someplace, thanks a lot. I hope you're enjoying your, um, he, he said, um, he's never been to the west side of uh, Oahu, so he said he wanted to go and hang out at Yokohama Bay. I said, Yokohama Bay? Well, why are you going to go to Yokohama Bay? They make sushi out of little Japanese folks like me So in Yokohama Bay, so I don't know why you want to go to Yokohama Bay. He was, I don't know, I just want to take an adventure in Hawaii today. I said, okay, have your adventure. So um, God bless you, Pastor Pat, and your adventure. Um, yeah. So the title of our message is When Jesus Says. And we're going to be looking at this, this, this um, prayer called the High Priestly Prayer in John chapter 17. And this prayer right here is like a, a, a prayer of, you know, somebody going away, Jesus. He's going to be going away from his disciples that he spent tons of time, maybe three years of day and night time with them. And there's like all this affection. You know, it was like if I was going away to like a business trip or something, I would be cheering and all that. No, no, we wouldn't be cheering. But I would take some time the night before I leave to talk to my kids. I would take some time to talk to my kids and say, hey, guys, um, this is what's happening right now. Um, I love you so much, you know. Um, I love you so much, and, and I'm going someplace because I, I need to take care of the family, I want to help to take care of mama, and, and this is something that I'm called to do, you know, as a daddy, you know, and, and, and kids, I love you so much, don't worry, uh, I'll be back soon. And, and, and kids, this is what I want you to do when I'm gone. I want you to help your mother, I want you to obey her, I want you to tell her every morning how beautiful she is. This is what I want you to do. And that's what Jesus is doing right now in this high priestly prayer. We get a glimpse of, of who Jesus is, his interest, and what he thinks of us. You know, when Jesus says something, uh, it, you can take it to the bank. When other people say something, eh, not so much. You know, people, you know, they fail us all too often. And so sometimes when we come into this, this, this relationship with Jesus, man, we come in with these expectations that the world has put on us. Like, don't trust. You know, only trust them as far as you can throw them kind of thing. And it's like, oh, man, Jesus is like, no, 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 not like that with me. He's like, if I say it, then it's true. If I say it, it's who I am. If I say this, this is how I want you to be or who you are, this is who you are. And so Jesus, right now, right, we're going to look in, in John chapter 17. It's in your notes. He, he boils it down. He says, this is eternal life. Whoa. That's a major statement right there. Can you guys underline that? Tattoo it to your arms everywhere. He says, this is eternal life right here. He's saying, this is what salvation is going to be like. This is what the end game is going to be like. This is the hope that all of you guys are hopeful for right here. This is eternal life. That they may know you, Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This know that he talks about, you know, is this know called gnosko. 
right? It's a Greek word, ginosko, and I just gave you the Greek word of the day. Everyone say ginosko. You can woo all your friends. You know, and this word ginosko, right, it's a knowing that not just like, oh, I know my way to, you know, my friend's house. I know um, this speaker over here makes sound. It's more than a know like that. You know, um, in, in, in Israel, Israel, there's these, these tours that they take these um, uh, Christians on to go and see the footsteps of Jesus. And um, there's these tours that, that they have these, these guides who can go to all the, 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 the places of tradition and be able to tell you exactly verbatim what Jesus said there. They can tell you exactly the historical facts of, of, of what this place meant or that place meant. And they can tell you so much knowledge and information but they never really knew the person of Jesus. Um, I was listening to this guy, his name is Gary Burge, and he's a, he's a John scholar, and so we're in John today, so I was studying some of his stuff. And he said he was in Israel, and he was talking to one of his, uh, his Jewish uh, um, um, guides over there on these Christian tours. And this, this guide was just so, so smart. He knew everything about Jesus, but he didn't know Jesus. And so the, 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 the professor, Gary Burgess, he says, oh, um, um, so, you know, with all this knowledge of Jesus, um, do you believe in him? He goes, no, I'm, I'm Jewish, and I don't believe in that, you know? And so we can have all of this knowledge but miss something, right? And it's this knowing right here, this knowing at an intimate level. This knowing where it's deeper than just a head knowledge, but it's one where we're actually one. Where he lives in us, where, where he speaks with us, where he, he, he dines with us. The knowing, the genosko know, it's, it's, it's similar to like uh, something that mommies and daddies do together when they know each other. That was the, ex, no, the, the PG rated version of it, you know? But it's an intimate knowing. It's a knowing where he's saying, man, I really want you to be close with me. I want to have a relationship that's, that's so special with you. You know? And so the first thing that Jesus says to us is in your notes is this. Jesus says you're loved. Some of us may have grown up in the church and, and we memorize this, this scripture, John 3.16 some of us may not have even, you know, been in the church. This might be your first day, but you might have actually heard that, that, that scripture, John 3, 16, where, where God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And, and, and this scripture right here is such a powerful scripture. It talks about God Almighty loving you. We can't have Jesus culture until we start to understand the love of God. So when Jesus says, I love you and that you're loved, there's a response. There's a response that, that he in turn actually wants back from us. You know, we can't change the fact that he loves us, but we can change some of the facts in our lives of whether or not we love him. He's saying, I love you so much that I'll give you my son. I love you so much that I'll give you the most important thing that I could possibly give. You know, last week I was having this conversation with my mom, and she's like, oh, man, lots of this stuff is just so emotional. Emotional. You know, I'm not so into that emotional stuff. You know, why did that lady prophesy over you? What's going on? You know, and I'm like, oh, mom, oh, mom, no. We're excited because... We know Jesus loves us. We're excited because, because Jesus, right, he starts showing us his love. And, and, and then we start wanting to love him back. And it's like we go to the, the, the UH game. Yay, UH. Right? But you guys don't do that. You're like wild and bouncing up and down, cheering and doing all that. But then, oh, when it comes to loving Jesus, can we say that it's okay to be excited about loving Jesus? Yeah. 
we even started to go further in that conversation because my, my mom, she's a PK, so, so she grew up in the church, right? And she really loved Jesus while she was growing up. And she said that she was at this one youth camp and, and she was being excited for Jesus, like praising and worshiping and, and, and just telling everybody like, oh, this is awesome. And then all the kids at the youth camp told her this, you're such a Jesus sight. And my mom goes, oh, a Jesus sight? What does that mean? What, 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 what does that mean? And then, and then the kids, they start going, you're just so overly excited about Jesus. And she goes, oh. I am overly excited about Jesus. I, I love Jesus. I am a Jesus sight. You know, and, and my mom is over there and she's like, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. You know, like, I'm being like called out. I'm being marked, you know, because I love Jesus and I'm excited about Jesus. But that scripture in Revelation chapter 2, it goes back to this thing of remembering Remembering John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his son. Remembering what it was like when we first received Jesus. Sometimes, you know, we get so comfortable in our lives. And then we forget about these, these, these truths that God has for us. That need to be so vibrant and so, you know, at the forefront of who we are. Sometimes in our daily devotions, it may become mundane and routine, you know, like what Pastor Calvin was saying about the running, but it's got to be vibrant. It's got to be alive. And we have to be people who grow, okay? Can we all commit to be growers in this place? Because you know what? If we don't grow, guess what? We die. You know, we die. And... Jesus, right, he's over here and he's saying, I pray that you guys would be glorified also so that my Father may be glorified. I pray that the fruit of the Spirit would be evident in your lives, that there would be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control overflowing in all of you so that God the Father may be glorified. But you know, many of us, right, we, we get comfortable in our Christian lives. And then we just need a, a little bit of a shaking sometimes to, to get us back on it. And, and this week, man, I tell you, man, four funerals, two weddings, it's a shaking for me, you know, when I, when I have those types of things. But really what it does is it reminds me, right, it gets me out of my Christian self and my Christian sphere and my Christian community, and it takes me back to the place of Nicodemus, Right? John 3, 16, it's, it's this scene where Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee. He's one of the teachers of the religious law. And he comes in the darkness of night. He comes in the darkness of night and he, he, he checks in on Jesus. He goes, hey, Jesus, I need to talk story with you a little bit. Okay, come in. <clears throat> he comes in and he's all low pro. He's got his hat down like this so nobody can see him coming in. You know, and Nicodemus, he starts asking Jesus questions. He's like, Jesus, um, we know that you must be of God or from God because of all these things that you're doing right now and how you preach and the words that you, that you say. I mean, they carry eternal life in them. Okay, so I know that. Okay, I'm Nicodemus, right? Um, but Jesus, I'm kind of scared. I'm kind of scared if anybody finds out that I'm here talking with you, that I'll be cast out from the temple. I'll be shut down and cut off, you know, from, from, from what the rest of the world says. And so when we have these funerals and weddings, it really reminds us, right, what it's like to not know Jesus. How scary it is. What it's like to have troubles and problems that, that we don't have answers for yet. You know, in, in these funerals and these, these weddings, I, I, I get to see a whole bunch of different families who, who maybe aren't even a part of the church, right? And then I get to talk story with them, and then some of them are grieving, and they have no hope. And then I tell them about Jesus, and they're like, oh, that sounds really good. That, that we can be with this God 
that that's maybe where mom is. And then we get to remember what it's like not to be a Christian. Right? Just the other day, I was, I was at the funeral, right? And, and um, <laughs> I was talking to my family out there, you know, and trying to remember what it was like before I knew Christ. And, and as I was remembering what it was like before I knew Christ, oh, I, all, it just started to flood me, you know, of, of all of these fears, all of these, these things that, that I just thought there was no hope for. And even the things that I was ashamed of, and, that, and I'm like, oh, man, that's what all these people are dealing with right now. And they're thinking about God right now because at a funeral, right, we think about the things that are the most important. What happens to me when I die? Is God really real? And then they think about their loved ones too. I never heard anybody on their deathbed talking about their 401k or their retirement fund or their toys or anything like that. I heard some really godly pastors on their deathbed say, oh, right now I, I kind of truly understand what it means to live as Christ and to die as gain. And it's on a deathbed, it's not at a funeral when we start to see these things that are so valuable, that they hold the power of eternal life in them. So I ask a question, you know, at the funeral, I say, um, can you guys reflect on this? Can you reflect on how is my relationship with God? Do I know him? Do I have one? Does it need some work? And how are my relationships with those that are the closest to me? And everybody gets real staunch and, and, and quiet. And then I give them an opportunity to receive Jesus and to start taking away those things and breaking those barriers and those obstacles And then I start to bring them hope. And and that's what John 3.16 is, guys. It's it's that love that God has for us right there that we can never, ever, ever get like, oh, John 3.16, woo, okay, pass on, right? It's no, we're loved. We're loved so much by God the Father that he would give so much to us. Number two in your notes is this. It's we're called friends. I was looking at a, um, a, <clears throat> a survey done by Forbes magazine about the things that people want the most in life. One is acceptance and friends. You know, nowadays, I, I, you know, as I meet with people and stuff, you know, I ask them questions about, oh, who's your best friend? I got that from Pastor Carl. You know, he, he always asks those kind of really profound questions. Who's your best friend? You know? And, and more times than not, People are like, oh, well, you know, take care of my family, you know, take care of my family. Responsibility, I'm busy, you know, don't have time for that kind of thing, you know. Got to make sure, you know, that I'm, I'm spending enough time over here, but, but what about friends? Jesus says that this is something that's so important. And he's saying, I don't, I don't, I don't call you slaves anymore. I don't call you robots I don't call you my possession, I call you my friends. And then he starts to define it, what a friend looks like, and he says, I spend time with you, and I tell you secrets, and I share my heart with you, and I just want to be with you. Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you a friend. That's John 15, and in John 15, you know, Jesus, he's over there, and he's talking about, man, what it looks like to be a friend of God. And, and he says, man, if you knew, you know, all the things that I'm telling you, if you started to understand these things that I'm telling you, that, man, all this is, is, is leading up for us to be together, for, for you to, to know me, to glorify me, to glorify the Father, and then be with me forever. If you just knew this, you would do what I'm asking you to do. So Jesus, he's pleading with the disciples and he's pleading with us. He's saying, if you're my friend, can you do what I'm asking you to do? 
And this specifically right here is what he's asking us to do. Love one another. Love one another. He's saying, by this, your love for one another, then, then I will be glorified. You will be known. My Father will be known. If you do this one thing, and if you do this one thing, then, then we can be friends. We can be friends and share intimate space. We can know each other in such a way. You know, our house is super busy because we have like 100 kids, right, all the time. And then so, um, you know, I, I never, I, I try not to now, yeah, I'm limiting my time away, right? Like gym, I don't go gym anymore, right? So I'm doing that for her, not going gym. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> one Sunday night, right, one Sunday night, like, you know, Ross texted me, he goes, oh, bro, coming over or what? You know? And I'm like, oh, nah, better not, you know. Better spend time with the family. Better spend time with the family, you know. Oh, nah, 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 better spend time with the family. You know, even my, my, my real good Christian reply, oh, I'm spending time with the family, you know, quality time, quality time, you know. And then um, Ayako, our text messages, they kind of share with each other, and she goes, hey, why are you not going to go hang out with Ross? I go, oh, because... Um, Spend time with the family, spend time with the family, you know? She goes, no, no, Jay, you don't have enough friends. You better go spend time with Ross. <laughs> I'm like, bruh, you're not my friend then, you know? But, but really, I mean, even, even, I mean, all of us, I'm guilty, you know? Not spending enough time with, with friends, investing in those types of relationships which are so valuable. Pastor Wayne, he has this calendar thing, and he says on his 5%, one of the top 5% of what he has to make sure that only he can do is spend quality time with friends. Invest in friendships and relationships. You know? Like, I, 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 I do orchids right now. How come I do orchids? Because they don't talk back. You know? And the church, they, no, 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 no. But no, no, I, I do orchids because, man, you know, I get my peace in there. You know, it's like so good, right? You know, I, I gather orchids, right? You know, and so we talk about, hey, what kind of hobbies do you have? I go, oh, I, I'm an orchid gardener. And they go, how old are you, 88 years old? I'm like, yeah, a little bit, you know. At least I don't do bonsai. Oh, Pastor Calvin. Pastor Calvin, he's the bonsai master. But so, right, I say I do orchids, right? And I was listening to this, this illustration that Pastor Wayne was making the other day. And he goes, oh, he, he collect bottle caps, he collect stamps. But this other guy, when they asked him, what do you collect? He goes, friends. Ooh, I wish I had that answer. But I think it's not too late, you know? It's not too late to start making sure that we're investing in the things that are really important to God, Right? And that's why this right here can be a reminder for us that, that friendship is important to Jesus. You know, if, if he was having that talk with the kids right before they're going away, he was like, hey, make sure you're being a good friend to your friends. You know? So he calls us friend. Number three in your notes is the last one. It's this. And I think this one right here is kind of like the, the most important one. <clears throat> is when Jesus says, I desire you. I desire you. You know? In the book of Revelations, right, we talk about, you know, what, it look, what Jesus looks like, right? So, whoa, white hair, right? You know, the, the bronze and feet, you know, and, and man, the white robes and all that kind of stuff, right? emerald oceans and all that kind of stuff around him. You know, all of these things in these images. But one thing that really sticks out is this, eyes of fire. Okay? Eyes of fire. Jesus, okay, has eyes of fire for you. They're blazing for you because his heart is blazing for you. His heart is one where it's like, Apart from you, man. Apart from you, I, 
It makes me sick when I'm apart from you. In Revelation chapter 4, we hear about the, the lukewarm and then boom, right? He says he spits you out of the mouth, but he's not sick of you. He's sick for you. Jesus is saying, I'm so lovesick over you. Last week, we talked a little bit about the bride, bride paradigm, and it's like he's saying, I'm so lovesick for my bride. I remember when I was dating Ayako, I would go through any length to come after work and spend time with her to the late wee hours of the morning because I was lovesick for her. And Jesus is saying the same thing in, 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 in John chapter 17 in this high priestly prayer. He's saying, my desire is for you. I have this kind of emotional heart for you. My joy is made complete when I have you with me. We did this icebreaker in this meeting the other day, and it's like, what is your picture of, of your room in heaven going to be like? My father has a mansion. He's making a room for us, you know. What is our room going to look like? It's going to look like sitting at the right hand of the Father with Jesus. Oh. There's no better place anywhere than that. To have the full manifest presence full understanding even of Jesus right there with you. To gaze on his beauty, to inquire of his wisdom all the days of our life, to worship him with all of our hearts. And guess what, guys? Jesus desires that of us. He desires us to be with him. He desires us even to be lovesick. And he's saying, remember, remember that first love. Remember that first love and how it was at the beginning. I remember when I first got saved, I got saved from, from drug addiction, you know? I was watching Pastor Wayne on the TV, and I'm like, whoa, who listens to this? Boom, it's to be the most eternal decision you ever make. And I'm like, yeah, I need it. And then boom, just like that, God delivers me from my drug addiction. Start saving my life, changing my life. And then I start to know this person, this, this man, Jesus, who's God Almighty in the flesh. And it was like, I couldn't get enough of being with him. I would hear what the pastor would say on the, on the pulpit, and I'd be like, okay, more. Tell me more instruction of what it's like to be with him. So family, I think today is that, that reminder from from Jesus himself to remember, to remember that love. And, and maybe for some of us, it's to receive that love today. Kimi mentioned, she goes, you know, maybe there are some things, some places of bondage, right? And, and Lord, bring those things up, but what do you need to break through this bondage? Let me just tell you what you need. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that anyone who would believe in him would have eternal life. Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn this world, but to save this world. 